Okay, so I'll talk at you for um, close to an hour, and then we'll have half an hour um, for discussion. So I want to start um, by mentioning methodological nationalism. Um, many of you will know the term. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Ulrich Beck and Nathan Snyder have labeled um, the way that we normally organize our work methodological nationalism. That is the idea that we take the nation state as the starting point, as the framework for understanding anything. Um, and we're so very, very used to that. And we do that in various fields, um, including uh, in the field of education. But we live in a time of globalization in which the local and even the national are quite increasingly taken up in relation to the global, whether unreflexively as a taken for granted conception of the status quo or more thoughtfully as historicized and examined through or alongside nuanced concepts of transnationalism, the diaspora, cosmopolitanism, and the global. And the field of education is no um, exception to this. Oh, it actually works. And maybe I should move. Okay. Um, so um, in the field of education, uh, the field is currently marked by uh, the renewal of post-colonial education, as in the work of uh, Fazal Rizvi, the ascendancy of notions such as the internationalization of the curriculum, um, in the work of people like Olson, the emergence of cosmopolitan education, um, pop poets in the States, uh, Singh uh, in Australia, thus addressing even the particularly nation-state-based concepts uh, of multiculturalism and multicultural education appear to demand a, cons uh, a consideration of the larger global context and its effects on the national and the local. In turn, it also demands turning away from the trans traditional nation-based uh, approach and instead taking up the alternative that Beck and Snyder recommend, namely a cosmopolitan approach and framework of analysis. Now, my intention is this essay is not to jump on the globalization discourse bandwagon to eschew the nation as per se, but rather, as multiculturalism demands, to take up the national seriously while taking into account the effects of global developments. As I've pointed out elsewhere, the national and older conceptions of community remain as boulders in the stream of change that are cutting edge theorization and human activity that constitute what following Zygmunt Bauman's work on liquidity, I have referred to as liquid communities. Taking all this into consideration, I want to address multiculturalism and multicultural education. I will make my arguments in two parts. First, I will utilize methodological nationalism to point to topics and developments of the status quo of Canadian multiculturalism and multicultural education, and then proceed to complicate this initial account by way of reference to how Canadian multiculturalism can be alternatively seen through a prism that refracts both global and national developments. To provide an orderly account of multicultural education in Canada requires suspended disbelief about the nation state. It demands utilizing a conception that involves taking up the nation state as given, solid, as not only the primary source of policy, but also the primary locus of identity, identification, and allegiance, shared norms and values. It also demands that one take up multiculturalism and by extension multicultural education as a distinct, clearly definable concept. Um, okay, we'll stick with that. A clearly de definable concept and policy that followed as a successor regime to race relations, which in turn was an improvement on assimilation and explicitly exclusivist and racist immigration policies that reflected Eurocentric conceptions of the nation. Multiculturalism thus conceptualized is built on several pillars, 
First, the three founding peoples, Canada's two solitudes, the English and the French, plus First Nations. Second, a willingness to recognize cultures and peoples beyond the founding peoples as integral to the nation. Third, a third liberalism or neoliberalism as hegemonic national ideology. Fourth, tolerance for diversity, including the exceptionalism of Quebec and recognition of indigenous peoples as citizens plus. Okay. So it bears reiterating that Canada was the first country to adopt multiculturalism as official policy for addressing difference, a process that started off with the work of the Bilingualism and Biculturalism Commission of 1963, became manifest through what liberal government of Pierre Elliott Trudeau in 1971 conceived of as multiculturalism within a bilingual framework, and solidified and clarified through the Canadian Multiculturalism Act of 1985, which was enacted by conservative government of Barr Mulroney in 1988. By the 1990s, Will Kimlicker, one of the enthusiastic proponents of Canadian multiculturalism, could declare simply, confidently, and reassuringly that as official federal policy, and especially with its marriage to liberalism, the multiculturalism program is working. Finally, it demands that one recognize multiculturalism as being so successful and ubiquitous, so ingrained in the national psyche that it no longer simply, is no longer simply a set of policies and philosophical outlook, but is now an ideology, as people like Kogila Adam Moodley and Roxana Ng have pointed out an ideology that is part and parcel of the very character of the nation. Our image text of a liberal, tolerant, celebratory multiculturalism is as Canadian as the Mounties and maple syrup. As, as um, Janice Grostein cogently puts it, multiculturalism has become part of the sticky stuff of Canadian identity, end quote. Given this context, it is not surprising that education in Canada is not only marked, but is indeed thoroughly infused with multiculturalism. It characterizes everything from policy and curriculum at the provincial, school district, and individual school levels to pedagogy in the classroom and guides schools' relationships and interactions with parents and communities. However, multiculturalism is not the only framework that has been employed for addressing diversity in education in Canada. Most notably, Quebec has eschewed multiculturalism in favor of the interculturalism and intercultural education alternative. And even uh, in the rest of Canada, other discourses are at work in approaches to diversity and equity education. So I'm just taking British Columbia as one example, and I'll give you six school districts, and you'll see that multiculturalism is there, it's very dominant, but there are other discourses at work as well. So you've got, uh, sorry, move on. We've got, so you've got multiculturalism and anti-racism, diversity and anti-discrimination in U.S. minister, which doesn't even mention multiculturalism. Thus, in addition to interculturalism being official education policy, curriculum guide, and pedagogical approach in Quebec, other discourses from generalized diversity and anti-discrimination to more specific anti-racism and race relations have formed the basis of diversity and equity policy in a Canadian educational system dominated by multiculturalism. Some examples are historical. In the 1990s, under the rare leftist government of the New Democratic Party, the province of Ontario's Ministry of Education and Training shifted for a few years from an education policy based on multiculturalism to one based on anti-racism. Still other examples are quite contemporary. At the higher education level, internationalization and global citizenship and now interculturalism are all the vogue at the University of British Columbia, currently promoting um, uh, a global citizenship and establishing a number of centers concerned with inter intercultural communication at UBC. 
including most recently the development by the Office of the Provost and VP Academic of the UBC Intercultural Understanding Strategic Plan. These efforts in recent history and the present day and across various levels and locales of education represent two moves beyond multiculturalism. First, a move beyond the local and national, and second, the introduction of another discourse. However, it is important to note that these two moves tend to be seen and taken up as complementary and supplementary to what is essentially a dominant, even if lately not so often explicitly named, multicultural frame for education in Canada. Indeed, the same is true for Canadian multicultural education in the face of recent global events. Multicultural education in Canada absorbed and survived internal critiques from both conservatives, the back to basics argument and calls for a coherent Europhile national heritage and social cohesion, and leftist critiques, which involved the exposure of the much vaunted mosaic as a hierarchy of cultures, criticism of the failure of liberal multiculturalism to address the perennial problem of, ra of racism, and consequent calls for anti-racist education. In what I would characterize as the awkward resilience of Canadian multiculturalism and multicultural education, Canada is out of step with much of the Western world. By this I mean Canada has managed despite a few minor bumps, such as its own homegrown 2006 Toronto 18 radical Islamist terrorist plot and the wrongful deportation and torture in Syria of Maher Erar, to largely avoid not only the death of multiculturalism discourse, but also the related 21st century Islamophobia that has gripped the United States and Western European countries the purported clash of civilizations discourse in the U.S., new citizenship tests in Holland, the obsession with discerning ordinary Muslims from terrorist Islamic radicals in Britain, and the laws which fetishize burqas as instruments that undermine national unity uh, and identity in France. So that's one kind of take, right? Um, the rest of the paper much longer take changes things up a bit. The reality of multiculturalism and multicultural education's characteristics and trajectories and conceived place in Canada is much more nebulous than the typical functionalist account I have just provided. And both a reconsideration of multiculturalism and multicultural education from within Canada and especially in a global frame expose a rather less sure-footed career and prompts a rethinking of the status quo and future of Canadian multiculturalism and multicultural education. For example, while official multiculturalism helps promote its conception as largely fixed and given as a neoliberal discourse in Canada, multiculturalism has always been not only a floating signifier, but indeed a highly contested and at times polarizing concept. The legacy of right and left critiques haunting the supposed well-entrenched hegemony of singular multiculturalism and multicultural education. As a floating signifier, multiculturalism is variously and simultaneously a set of official social policies, a philosophical outlook, a practical political stance, and a heuristic guide for day-to-day -day living with difference. Also, as Stuart Hall and David Theo Goldberg have helpfully pointed out, the term refers both to the fact of diversity, the coexistence of various racial and social and ethnic groups in society on the one hand, and the discourses, stances, and policies that facilitate the hopefully positive coexistence of that diversity on the other. Most importantly, while it is usually discussed in the singular, conceptions of multiculturalism span the political spectrum, as Stuart Hall, Peter McLaren, Joe Kinchlow, Shirley Steinberg have all asserted, which means we can and perhaps should recognize several distinct forms of multiculturalism. And from Peter McLaren, you can get 
in those various forms, conservative, corporate, liberal, or now I would say neoliberal even, left liberal, and uh, critical, insurgent, and revolutionary forms of multiculturalism. So that's why I keep insisting that multiculturalism is a floating signifier. So even official Canadian multiculturalism, which as policy one would expect to be relatively fixed in its meaning, has evolved over time and continues to evolve. Right? So here's a source that begins to get you at how Canadian multiculturalism um, uh, policy has changed in terms of its focus, in terms of its reference points, in terms of its mandate, in terms of the problem that it's supposed to be addressing, uh, the source of that problem, in terms of the solutions that it puts forward, and in terms of the key metaphor that we, that we use to talk about multiculturalism. If we think only about the, the key metaphor, for example, we go from the 1970s when it was about a cultural mosaic to the 1980s when the emphasis was on creating a level playing field uh, to the 1990s when it was about belonging. And uh, some of my students' favorite in, uh, in the 2000s, it's now about what is being called harmony jazz. Right? So similarly, while liberal multiculturalism is the hegemonic pedagogical approach, there, there is in fact a range of approaches to multicultural pedagogy. Um, and Margaret Epp is one of the people who has pointed out, do I have that slide? Yeah. So Margaret Epp is one person who has pointed out what those different approaches are. So we can go from mere contribution of others to a Eurocentric curriculum uh, to a somewhat more substantial inclusion of difference through an add and stir approach to a critical multicultural education for educational and social transformation to actual leftist activist social transformation and multicultural pedagogy. So there's a range of uh, political stances that somebody can take within what everybody might want to call multicultural pedagogy. So taking up individually, the history of the right-wing uh, critiques of multiculturalism, the pliancy of multiculturalism's meaning and characteristics, the Quebec interculturalism alternative, and the proliferation of juxtaposed discourses at the school district level can all be readily taken up as supplementary. However, collectively, and especially with a consideration of global developments around multiculturalism, it is difficult not to begin to reinterpret them as constituting quite significant cracks in multiculturalism's hegemony. Crevices which amount to a largely undeclared but ongoing erosion of Canadian multicultural education that is leading gradually but perhaps inexorably to the end of multiculturalism and multicultural education. In fact, all indication, by all indications, we appear to have arrived at the end of multiculturalism and by implication, the end of multicultural education around the world. From early rumblings such as um, Yopke's, um, from early rumblings such as uh, Yopka's indication of the retreat of multiculturalism in Australia, the Netherlands, and Britain. We have in newspaper accounts in countries from Canada and the United States to Europe-based online newspapers, as well as in scholarly journals and books, the very death of multiculturalism has been pronounced rather definitively. Also, successive leaders of conservative ruling national parties in Western European countries, including German uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, French President Nicolas Sarkozy, and Britain's Prime Minister David Cameron, have all weighed in, driving in what are supposedly the, na the last nails into the coffin of multiculturalism in Europe. Angela Merkel, for example, famously declared in an address to the youth branch of the conservative Christian Democratic Union Party at Potsdam that, quote, multiculti, the idea that we are now living side by side and are happy about it, this approach has failed totally, end quote. 
So although these uh, developments, and especially the statements by prominent conservative European leaders, have been most widely acknowledged, progressive academics and policymakers have been warning for some time about the coming end of multiculturalism. In Australia, Ian Eng and John Stratton, commenting of the, on the surge of populist support for Pauline Hansen, a woman who translated her objection to immigrants from Asia into a successful political career, they refer to as Australian crisis, uh, multiculturalism in crisis. Addressing diversity and the role of multiculturalism in Britain following the 7-7 bombings in London, Nick Pierce, the director of the Institute for Public Policy Research, gave his 2005 parliamentary brief the prescient title, Goodbye to Multiculturalism, but Welcome to What? And Paul Gilroy insisted he could only speak to multiculture in Britain rather than multiculturalism, since, as for the latter, quote, in Britain at least, he says, there is no such ideology. The desire for it died many years ago in the ashes of the Inner London Educational Authority and the Greater London Council, end quote. In the United States, Kristen Sleater, the president of the National Association for Multicultural Education, NAME, reports in a June 2011 NAME blog entry that she was asked by an anti-racist educator at that whether there was any further need for multicultural education in the United States, let alone for an association like Maine. Such fatalist talk about multiculturalism and multicultural education may have passed into the commonplace elsewhere, but in Canada this, it still remains relatively uncommon. However, while uncommon, such talk is beginning to appear. Although it was received as provocative at the 2009 Invited International Conference on the Status Quo of Multicultural Education, which I organized as director of the Center for Cultural Identity and Education, the title of the keynote address by John Wolinsky was simply, What Was Multiculturalism? And this suggested that multiculturalism is already de facto something from Canada's past, rather than its present, let alone its future. Similarly, Sneja Ganu, who's actually here today, um, of UBC's English department in her talk just last month at Green College suggested not only that Canadian multiculturalism was a discourse of the past, but identified cosmopolitanism as a definitive successor regime in her talk, and you'll get it from the title here again, Back to the Future, Post-Multiculturalism, imminent cosmopolitanism. Right? And there have been rumblings from the field of education as well. Um, in his 2011 Canadian Society for the Study of Education conference presentation on his study of the latest social studies textbooks, Employment of Multiculturalism, Kurt Clausen reported that his findings indicate that multiculturalism is taken up increasingly in Canadian textbooks as a historical, specifically 1970s discourse. Furthermore, multiculturalism is no longer utilized in the textbooks as the overall framework for Canadian social diversity and culture. Rather, it has either been replaced by concepts such as diversity, human rights, anti-discrimination, etc. Or when it did appear, it is w as one among several such terms rather than the overall framework concept. Carlson concluded that employing multiculturalism as comprehensive framework for social studies today would be like him trying to fit into his disco era suit. Finally, in contrast with with this education example of a quiet shift away from multiculturalism in textbooks. The Globe and Mail published a 2010 editorial that needs little in elaboration in its stark title, quote, strike multiculturalism from the national vocabulary, end quote. These examples represent, albeit fitful Canadian acknowledgement of and contributions to a global discourse based on the death of multiculturalism, an assumption that we've moved beyond multiculturalism.
there is a tendency to discuss only multiculturalism as, as um, the official diversity discourse in Canada, a tendency which carefully avoids the awkwardness of the fact that one province, Quebec, employs interculturalism rather than multiculturalism as official policy, including in the field of education. When interculturalism is mentioned, it is sometimes depicted as the Quebec version of multiculturalism, the difference being a matter of terminology rather than substance. Such depictions contribute to notions of a cohesive Canadian nation, acknowledging Quebec's distinct society character whilst glossing over Quebec's nationalism and the almost perennial danger of secession posed by the sovereignty movement. More nuanced takes tease out the points of connection and diversion between multiculturalism and interculturalism in Canada, as in Will Kimlicker's exploration of the possibility of intercultural citizenship within multicultural states. In other works, interculturalism is taken up as a discourse and set of policies based on a critique of Canadian multiculturalism, as in Alain Gagnon's discussion of the role for uh, of the rationale for and characteristics of Quebec's interculturalism. In the most controversial conceptions, interculturalism is situated in direct opposition to multiculturalism, used to demarcate Quebec from Canada and indeed assert Quebec's sovereignty, as in the following de declaration of Louise um, Baudin, the provincial party Bloc Québécois designated critique for secularism, and I quote her. She says, multiculturalism is not a Quebec value. It may be a Canadian one, but it is not a Quebec one. Even for the Quebec Liberal Party, because they're talking about interculturalism rather than multiculturalism, and it's supposed to not be the same thing. And we haven't signed the Constitution of Canada, neither the Parti Québécois nor the Quebec Liberal Party, end quote. Thus, the Quebec interculturalism alternative is also a floating signifier that can be conceptualized in various ways, each with strong political overtones. First, interculturalism can be seen as almost synonymous with multiculturalism, an interpretation which minimizes differences between the discourses and in turn between Quebec and the rest of Canada, and therefore suggests national cohesion marked by tolerance for diversity including policy diversity. Second, it can be seen in pragmatic culturalist terms as a distinct policy particularly suited for Quebec, in that unlike multiculturalism, which supposedly creates a level playing field for all cultures, interculturalism preserves and promotes Quebecois culture and the French language, both of which are in danger of disappearing in the larger national and indeed continental context dominated by Anglo culture and the English language. Finally, it can be seen as part of the proof of Quebec nationalism and a weapon in the arsenal for winning Quebec sovereignty, if not proof of its de facto existence. In short, while multiculturalism is a crucial part of the contemporary repertoire for imagining a unified Canada characterized by tolerance and celebration of sociocultural diversity, Quebec's interculturalism troubles Canada's image text. It is at best a wrinkle that is smoothed out by adding a layer of tolerance and celebration of policy diversity to the national image text. At worst, however, it keeps alive the historical narrative of Canada as two solitudes, as well as the perennial specter of secession and therefore exposes and disrupts the constructiveness of the Canadian nation as imagined community. Quebec's interculturalism is not, only an, is not only an alternative to Canadian multiculturalism, but a form of resistance against it. It is perhaps the most prominent in part because it is official, but it is hardly the only counter-hegemonic discourse working against the grain of multiculturalism and multicultural education. We need look no further than our own faculty of education here at UBC to find examples of identity-based ambiguity about and even rejection of multiculturalism and its construction of education, 
uh, and of local and national community. Um, Annette Henry, who is here, drawing on Sylvia Winter, identifies herself as a steadfast anti-multiculturalist. Right? Jan Hare speaks to a very tense contradiction between Aboriginal positionality and multicultural education, and in the end rejects multiculturalism. And I myself have frequently said it ain't easy being black in BC, especially before and after Black History Month. And as someone clueless about hockey, I can only scratch my head at the failure of the attempted interpolation of the message on the buses, we are all Canucks. <laughs> How well is multicultural education working when progressive minority, visible minority and Aboriginal educators feel they do not truly belong in Canada, but are perennially what Gayatri Spivak has identified as the not quite not citizen. And swirling around outside Canada and even within is the theoretical and praxis turn to multiculturalism's alternatives, a set of turns that appears to take as given the de facto or imminent demise of multiculturalism. For the 2012 Crossroads in Cultural Studies Conference, I organized a panel which I titled Difference at the End of Multiculturalism. And the three presentations gives you just a taste of what I have identified as the swirling alternatives. Uh, Mika Nava of the University of East London presented on her notion of a visceral cosmopolitanism as the best way to understand both historical and contemporary diversity in England. Yoka Hermes of In Holland University made a case for a return to cultural studies politics of difference for taking up diversity in Holland in such a way as to get beyond the problem of the supposed indigestible Muslim in Dutch society. And our own Mary Bryson presented work based on biopolitics and hence steered us away from the overemphasis on a sociality framework and toward a focus on populations and the body. And even as we might get dizzy from the wide array and swirling array of alternative conception, conceptual frameworks for taking up identity, diversity, and community, Zygmunt Bauman spins us around even faster by assuring us in his work on liquidity in books like Liquid Love and Liquid Life that identity, relationships, and contemporary life in general are all transient, ever-shifting, and shallow, and that community was always already non-existent, a project we emphasize whether it's construction, maintenance, or supposed demise precisely because it never was. In sum, between the vestiges of earlier right-wing and left-wing critiques, the almost taken for grantedness of the death of multiculturalism discourse at the international level and its creeping national emergence. The quiet opting out from multiculturalism in school curriculum texts. The turn to interculturalism as official policy in various countries. The effects of Quebec's interculturalism to trouble its supposed national efficacy and popularity the swirling theoretical and po policy turns towards sexy, cutting-edge alternatives, the suggestion not only that the nation is a construction, but that identity is unstable, transient, and elusive, and community is a simulacrum of an impossible project, Canadian multiculturalism and, multiculturalism and multicultural education are awkward, uh, paradoxically awkward in their continued prevalence and complacent in a moment of grave danger. Interestingly, however, because Canada basks in the glow of its national and international image text as not only particularly socioculturally diverse and tolerant of diversity, but also the nation state that gave the world official multiculturalism, because multiculturalism survived earlier critiques, because the Canadian contributions to the global discourse on death of multiculturalism are relatively new, few, and fitful, 
because the shifts from multicultural education have been gradual and scattered with no clearly preferred singular alternative, and especially because multiculturalism remains firmly in place as policy and ideology and everyday approach to diversity, because of all these things, the moment of danger for Canadian multiculturalism and multicultural education is apparently unrecognized, or if recognized, largely unacknowledged. Multiculturalism and multicultural education remain complacently hegemonic in the face of a scattered, fitful, but potentially deadly attack from without and within, and a theory, praxis, and policy world moving on and rendering them passe. Taken up within a national frame, multiculturalism and multicultural education remain relatively safe, still dominant, still official, still the common sense everyday approach, still the sticky stuff of Canadian identity. However, eschewing strict methodological nationalism and taking up Canadian multiculturalism and multicultural education as global discourse in play with the national in the production of global discourse and advances in theoretical conceptions of diversity and difference means acknowledging that Canadian multiculturalism and multicultural education are facing a moment of danger, a dual external and internal threat that will only grow with time. Trevor Phillips warned of Britain, quote, sleepwalking into segregation, end quote. And Canada might similarly be sleepwalking toward the death of multiculturalism. Britain was not ready and Canada is similarly unprepared to provide a comprehensive, articulate, and definitive response when it is faced, as it looks increasingly like it soon will be, with Pierce's crucial question, not only about interpersonal relations, but also official federal and provincial policy, including education policy, and symbol of national identity. Goodbye to multiculturalism. But welcome to what? Thanks. And when I was uh, looking at the, the topic, um, I came across the term social inclusion that people are starting to use in Europe and also in Canada in some of the literature, um, thinking about multiculturalists both promoting diversity and tolerance and intercultural understanding, but also multiculturalism as equity and sort of uh, addressing the needs of more vulnerable populations. Is that something that you come across or think that's coming into dialogue? Or just yeah, it depends on what people mean by social inclusion. Um, at least it's better than social cohesion, which was the, the rigor a little while ago. Um, because uh, social cohesion was a term, I mean, away from, from sort of rights to, to responsibility. Um, and social inclusion can be, again, interpreted in various different ways. Um, it is being used a lot in the discourse um, in, in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of talk about social inclusion. Um, for me, as a, as a critical educator, um, as somebody who was sort of died, died in the wool critical pedagogy person before you move on to anything else, the issue is always about power. So when we say social inclusion, uh, who is including whom, based on what, uh, and who has power to, to include or not, or not include. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm wary about a lot of what is going on in the discourse of, of, of interculturalism, um, especially in Europe, not so much with the, with the, the Quebec version of it. Um, uh, so uh, yes, the term is being used, but again, these terms um, get used differently by different people to mean different things. Um, so for example, if, if we talk about uh, interculturalism in Mexico and people talk about inclusion there because in Mexico it's a very distinct thing that they're doing in terms of interculturalism. It's about 
bringing uh, Aboriginal peoples into um, official policy, official discourse. So that kind of version of inclusion, um, again, has its problems. But it means something very different than when we begin to. I'm, I'm wondering in some ways whether in inclusion, social inclusion, can be um, a radical thing or whether in, in, the, in the mouths of some people it's not, in fact, another way, a soft way of talking about assimilation. Well, I think just to put it, I think that's the same with multiculturalism. I mean, multiculturalism was sort of this rhetoric of just, you know, or it could have been critical multiculturalism where it is about, you know, fundamentally about equity. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do think in, in Europe some of the discussion is coming about because certain minorities are the ones dropping out, not doing well in school, and the dialogue that was part of multiculturalism was how to be more responsive to a diverse population, I think is being taken over a little bit by the discourse of social inclusion. And I see a little bit of it in Ontario. Yes. Maybe in that's Ontario. coming yes. to a rest. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if and if and if you use, and again it's like what what do people mean when they use the term? Right? So uh, the, all these terms are kind of malleable, and yes, some of it is starting off, I think, in a very hopeful frame, but I can e you can easily see how it can be appropriated for, I mean, I'm just, this is just my cynical self, uh, saying how it can be appropriated for uh, other kinds of politics. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I'm always amazed how you actually write out your thoughts, you know, it's a thoughtfully, it's just an inspiration thing. Mm. I do have something I'm struggling with, just thinking about multiculturalism. I guess the, the issue is, if you think about multicultures, right, we're looking at often ethnicities, right? Whereas when you're thinking of difference, I'm thinking of Hobo and Baba perhaps, or others, if you think about issues of difference, one can think also about gender difference, you could think about class difference, etc. So what I'm trying to figure out is what does multiculturalism bring us and how does that framework fit into other forms of difference such as gender and class and uh, sexual orientation and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm just struggling with that kind of, those issues. I don't comment on that. Um, yeah, that's another good question. Um, originally, yeah, multiculturalism was about ethnicities. Um, and this is why um, I, I think to some extent uh, the, the, the Americans have one up on us. They're not in very many ways, but in this particular way. Because multiculturalism is not official policy in the US, um, there was more a possibility of struggle over the term. And so there are certain people who have insisted that this is not just about cultural difference, it's also about social difference. So, in fact, the, the irony of thinking about multiculturalism, it's not about um, uh, social difference except about race, <laughs> so, which is, uh, you know, it's like a little bit weird. So we're really about uh, ethnicity and other things and culture, um, but we also want to do race. So it's that half-hearted take on including race somehow, which in the U.S. version, race was always front, front and center. So we already were getting into social difference. And so some people, including um, uh, Shirley, uh, have insisted on rethinking multiculturalism. I think that that's actually the title of the book, um, in which they introduce uh, social difference. So they're saying it is about gender. It is about um, social class. Uh, it is um, not so, they didn't mention sexual orientation, but yes. So there is a way now of taking, and you can even begin to talk about social um, identities in ways that are also cultural. I mean, you, there, there, there is a culture to, uh, there is a queer culture, for example. So we can't just separate in the neat way that early sociologists might want us to do, say, these are cultural issues, and over here are social issues. So a cultural studies approach already would have seen that these are imbricated. So yeah, I think that the way that people now want to talk about multiculturalism does in fact include uh, social difference. So we can no longer, but 
But again, when it comes to policy, you see, this is what happens. So policy makes it a lot more concrete to say this is what we're doing. And it's harder to infiltrate whilst it's kind of more like the, the Wild West in the U.S. where everybody can throw in their bit and let's struggle over it. Uh, one of the, the regrets that I have about Canadian multiculturalism is we can't do that mu as much of that as we would like to, uh, which is why people initially said, you know, I, I, based on what folks were doing uh, in Britain, I have no time for this stuff. It's too wishy-washy. Let's do anti-racism. That was the earlier argument, right? So we've gone beyond that argument. Now it's, I have no time for this stuff. We've theorized beyond it anyway, right? So now it's passe, which I think might be even more dangerous than, you know, the, the loggerhead thing between multiculturalism and anti-racism, right? Thanks for the walking um, presentation. It's really uh, inspiring for me. And my question is sort of tied to the previous one. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, multiculturalism is sort of, uh, and, and the like, discourses similar to that, mm -hmm. um, it's really an ideological territory um, contested at different times. Um, my my question is really around whether the discursive changes has to do with some, some kind of economic um, mm -hmm. arrangement of life in the context of globalization, mm -hmm. or you know, is that really cultural per se? Mm -hmm. you know, is that more broader? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the shifts, if you're talking about the shifts in how the discourses go, they've, they've always been, they're, they're not about the... Multiculturalism is supposed to be about culture, but the shifts are not, a, are not necessarily about cultural changes per se, but about political changes. Um, the move to talking very seriously about uh, social cohesion, for example, and responsibilities, right, came after 9-11, right? So all of a sudden, we don't have time for this kind of multiculturalism. At first it was, you know, let's just tolerate all kinds of cultures. Then it's a kind of liberal argument. Why can't we have a level playing field? You know, um, like a form of uh, uh, a feminism from the 70s or something <laughs> was being done at, some, at one point. Then it became, you know, no, what about, you know, people from the left were saying, what about, you know, our people's identities, forms of discrimination, especially and, uh, racism? Etc. Etc. So the onus has always been political from various sides. So there are activists acting from one side, and then governments acting uh, from another side. And it's interesting what that results in. Um, so, so the the push towards you know other th these forms of multiculturalism that are now more about people's responsibility to society and, and to whatever whatever else. Um, is, is a political one. And, and sometimes the, the political moves are amazing. Um, the, what are they called? The, the Liberal Party, is it called in Australia? That is actually conservative. It's hard for me to get my head around it. Yeah, the Liberal Party in Australia, for example, just did a quiet, almost kind of ignoring of, you know, of multiculturalism. So part of the question is, what does all of this mean for education? A lot of multicultural education is just going on as if nothing is happening, right? And, some, and then also quietly we're getting these moves away. Not without people, it's done in a very Canadian way. Nobody's saying, you know, oh, we're not going to do this multiculturalism thing anymore. This is quietly take it out, put diversity in the textbook. And this is going on. You know, this is what that study shows. All of those, I think, they're not necessarily cultural moves. The cultural does play a role, but it's, but it's the political or it's the politics of the cultural that really is, is driving things uh, in terms of how multiculturalism shifts and whether it shifts or not. Thank you, Andrew, for a most um, engaging uh, presentation here, and I think it is um, inspiring as our police says. I didn't have a specific question, but I had a comment, if possible, mm -hmm. on this. Because you, you, in the first part of your presentation, you really elaborated on the different articulation regarding the pronouncements of death 
throughout the Kipchoge. Mm -hmm. And I think I would like to say that when I think about the different contexts you referred to, France, Germany, Britain, probably there are also, you spoke about the US mm -hmm. and the, the kinds of processes currently starting in Canada. Mm -hmm. I would say one ought to be a little bit diff, uh, uh, cautious about how is the notion of death Mm -hmm. with regard to multiculturalism deployed in each of these contexts mm -hmm. because they might mean entirely different yeah. things and sometimes I would argue, at least in one or two cases I've looked into more carefully mm -hmm. it might mean actually a birth of multiculturalism mm -hmm. and I, I know, I, what I'm going to say is the following when you speak about France for example and Sarkozy's policies etc for, for long periods of time multiculturalism didn't make sense within a republican conception of things in France but it is, if one looks very carefully, it is precisely under a right, center-right kind of government that uh, Sarkozy represented, mm -hmm. and under the guise of facilitating privatization policies, that suddenly the Republican uh, mode of uh, deploying education, schooling, and the, the, the mixity that were, was to be ensured in public schools, etc., was becoming um, questioned from within the establishment because it opened the way to validate certain forms of privatization through the call for being multi more multicultural, more respect respectful of diversity within French society, etc. But similar calls for a multicultural approach came also from the extreme left in France. Mm -hmm. So you have all kinds of reverses, what I'm trying to say, of different kinds of or variations on the multicultural theme, not necessarily its ultimate depth. And particularly with regard to the European, European context, there is another kind of dimension which seems to me pivotal to take into consideration when one is evaluating what is happening to multiculturalism within the continental context, is the European Union as a transnational space and the creation of all kinds of structures which impose certain discursive but also legal forms on what could be uh, the political scene around culture and its deployment in different societies. So what I'm trying to say very briefly is I think the, 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 the I agree with you about the pronouncements of death, mm -hmm. but I think if one looks at the nuances and context within which these pronouncements are deployed, mm -hmm. I think one would see a much more variegated kind of much more multifaceted and even contradictory processes taking place. I, I, would, I would agree with you a hundred percent, which is part, part of the reason why when I put those examples up, I also said, like, here's what is being pronounced in various magazines, and then here's what some right-wing politicians are saying. And by the way, here's what some leftists are saying, because for me, it's always political. Mm -hmm. So yes, the death of multiculturalism is being pronounced <laughs> with, a, with a sense of different people having different political stakes. Right, in what they're pronouncing as the death of multiculturalism. That's one thing I would agree. There are nuances, but I only gave those examples because I don't want to go into too much of And the second thing I would say in, in return to that is you're, you're speaking about it as if those, in those countries people were willing to engage multiculturalism, and that's part of exactly what they were not willing to do. The multiculturalism was dead on arrival in those European countries, right? So it's not a matter of saying even... So when Angela Merkel made her statement, for her, there, there was no... There's no official multiculturalism in Germany. So what she was criticizing was not multiculturalism as we think about it in Canada, right? Both the fact of diversity and set of policies, but the very idea of people living... Um, in society together, in silos, is what she was critiquing. This idea that we can live uh, cheek to jaw with each other and then this can work. No, that is no longer working, right? So in Europe had already turned to say, we have to do, everybody has to deal with diversity, right? right? So Europe said, multiculturalism is not for us. What is for us is interculturalism, right? So even as you're making your argument, and I'm agreeing with you about your argument, your argument is more about diversity and how people appropriate diversity for various political ends, right. rather than about multiculturalism. So because Europe had already selected interculturalism for its own reasons. And part of what I'm seeing is all, many of the struggles that people fought
in Canada and the U.S. for, okay, why, what are we then doing if we're doing this interculturalism thing? What are we then doing about racism? I'm saying to them, really? <laughs> we asked that a long time ago. So it seems to me that interculturalism in some forms is a kind of busy work for progressive people. Okay, you addressed all these things, you know, bringing in other forms of identity, like Bonnie is suggesting. You addressed racism, but that was under multiculturalism. Now we're doing interculturalism, so please come address them all over again, over here. Right? This is what appears to be happening. <laughs> you know, this is why I'm calling it busy work. Why is the powers that be keep keeping on? You know, the, lib the neoliberal, you know, agenda keeps moving. And that's the kind of work. This is when I speak to people. I've, I've spoken with, uh, I was in, in Ireland and speaking to activists, and they said, oh, no, we don't do multiculturalism. And I said, why? Well, because multiculturalism doesn't, doesn't address um, diversity. So what do you know about multiculturalism? Well, it doesn't know. Well, what does it do? What do you know about it? They know hardly anything. They just know that it's supposed to not have worked somewhere else, which is why they're doing something better. Which is why, by the way, they also say, we're bringing you in as a Canadian expert of a very harmonious society to tell us how it works. I mean, the, the, the complete contradiction in the invitation that I've received, right, which is, you guys are perfect in Canada. And you're black, so please come and tell us how it works in Canada and how it works so beautifully, even though we've already established that we're not going to do it. <laughs> right? So, yeah, so the, the, I'm agreeing with you about the need for us to say that, yes, that it's very, very complex, and there are different ways of taking it up, and people have different agendas. I fully agree. But even the grounds on which the discussion is taking place is not always the same. So if you want to talk on multicultural grounds and somebody else is speaking on intercultural grounds, then you're not speaking on the same grounds. And there are people who have a vested interest. This is, this is why I am wary of the idea of moving beyond multiculturalism. I may be terribly old-fashioned, but I think there's something to be said about the struggle over that signifier multiculturalism. So um, let me echo the last two questions. Um, I think it's a wonderful moment when someone describes the death of multiculturalism because what do we have? Like? This is zombie multiculturalism. Yes! <laughs> there, was, there was a moment in the 90s in Australia when the Howard government banned the term mm -hmm. multiculturalism from all government documents. Mm -hmm. And I over here said, thank goodness, it's politicized again. So at least it drew attention. Mm -hmm. And I think as the previous question has been that proclaiming the death of multiculturalism is a way of actually recognizing it in this curious kind of way. Mm -hmm. But the question I want to ask is, and this one has been bothering me recently, is the issue that we kind of tiptoe around mm -hmm. um, in uh, an era where uh, differences in terms of religious differences mm -hmm. have become a coming in in ways that old-fashioned secularists like myself find alarming to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. And there are ways in which effective multiculturalism is now being channeled through debates around religion and religious beliefs or belief and secularism and even that makes different things. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you kind of engage with those kinds of questions around religious differences. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we do tend to skirt around them, and when we don't, uh, people are shocked. Um, I, I presented a paper in, in, in Holland, in Amsterdam. I was invited to give uh, the, the keynote address, and oh, I'm forgetting the title now. It was about um, um, uh, the, the place of um, Muslim students uh, in the Canadian context. And, and the organizers of the conference absolutely freaked out because the, the word Muslim was in my title. I think it was like between a, a rock and a hard place. So how do people negotiate and what have been the takes in the Canadian uh, context of how um, Muslim students are positioned 
uh, in education. So this tension that students might, might feel between wanting to uh, think about your faith in a certain way and what that might mean for education and what, uh, what multiculturalism then dictates. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right. Pe people said, are you sure this is the topic you want to address? Uh, and I said, yeah, that's my topic. And there was, there was this flurry of emails, like, what can you change to dive? I'm not, I'm not changing the title. That is the title. I, it would not be a problem for me to present such a paper um, in Canada. But I was underestimating exactly what you're bringing up, which is... Um, there was this paradoxical thing that I saw happening uh, in Holland. Everybody, everybody was dealing with the problem of well, what uh, Yoko Hermes and other people have called the, the, the undigestible Muslims, right? And people told me, we're completely, completely tolerant in Holland. We have taken in people from everywhere. We've had no problem until the Muslims came. Right? So, the, so the thing was turn around, and the problem was uh, everybody was, it's strange the way you're putting it, everybody was talking about it without really dealing with it. So the issues became how do you, how do you, I don't know, how do you get Muslim women to feel more emancipated? How do you get, so, so many papers at the conference were talking about Muslims, but in this horribly paternalistic way that I could not, for the life of me, believe that people felt quite outright, yeah, this is, you know, this is Dutch society. And I said, well, how are you then talking about multiculturalism, right? So you're, you're right in a sense, and the problem is a thorny one. I don't think, I have not spent enough time to really, see, I have not focused uh, on, that, on that issue. But it is a very interesting uh, kind of issue when I think somebody was saying in one of these tests, is it the Dutch test? Uh, people, Im potential immigrants are shown, for example, uh, pictures of two men kissing. And they say, how do you feel about that? Meaning in Dutch society, uh, this happens and we're tolerant of this. Right? So we want to be tolerant of you, but are you tolerant of this? So when you put, when you put um, forms of identity up against one another, which is something that you know, I, I did also in, when I, I did a, a workshop in Ireland, it, it throws people for a loop. We did a whole thing about uh, Muslims, Every, everybody was fine. Then we did a thing about sexual orientation the next day. It was like a week-long thing. Everybody was fine with it. And then I, you know, then I brought up the whole thing, and I had them read a few chapters of the book, A Murder in Amsterdam, right? which is about the, the, the murder of um, uh, uh, a gay guy who had made all kinds of anti-Islamophobic uh, 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 statements. And there's this discourse about, in Holland, there's a tradition of people making outrageous statements, and this is fine, right? Doesn't mean that the person is actually being Islamophobic or racist or whatever. There's just a tradition of doing that. So, so you put up two forms of identity up against one another, and all of a sudden, people came down specifically on, it came back to my own identity. You know, as a gay man, I don't accept that you know, somebody can say, you see? So we, 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 our tolerance, the supposed tolerance that we have, so it's sort of about tolerance until it actually touches us, right? So I don't have an answer to what you're raising. I think certain things are now becoming, you know, quite iffy. Somebody was telling me lately that there are now areas in London where people are being told, you know, women are being told, you know, you, this is a Muslim area. You might need to cover up somebody walking to work. It's like, well, you know, so what? So we're getting to what are the limits of tolerance? Who, who is tolerating whom to what extent? And whose rights are being infringed on, right? So it can become quite complicated. And I don't necessarily have the answers to that. 
Um, but yeah, it's this is where the rubber hits the road, uh, I think. There was the proclamation that there is now a new department in, in the Harbour government for religious um, uh, yes. uh, and, uh, and the consultations apparently were not exactly inclusive of anything other than Christian. So when we say religious, it's always, I mean, what, what do we mean? Do we mean all religions? You know, or is this a way to begin to slip Christianity back into you know, official discourse? You know? All right, so thank you very much. It was a very inspiring talk. Um, I think I have, you need to, to verify it for me because I, I might have understood it wrong. You're defending the idea that we should protect the label or the signifier and mm. repopulate it with alternatives that mm. you have shown so that we can protect. Are you, are, we, are, are you saying this needs to be done in Canada or are you saying it should be done in a way that it can be exported? And I'm going to explain mm. why I think mm. this, is, this might be problematic mm. because I think there is a difference between thinking about multiculturalism in settler states, mm -hmm. in large settler states, mm -hmm. and then thinking about it in terms of Euro European countries like mm -hmm. the Netherlands or even Finland or Nordic countries mm -hmm. that are small and they're being um, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They are they, they, probably they, it's, a, it's a, I see it as a response to neoliberalism. They see themselves as vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, and their sovereignty is is, is being questioned now um, in that sense. So is the completeness of the, the ethnos that they, they represent. But I have two uh, two examples of things that have happened in the in this world. I think in the last two years, one very recent and one uh, that happened at the beginning of last year, where you see, for example, um, the promotion of the European Union in, in, in YouTube videos and the idea that it needs to expand. So it's a discourse of interculturality being mobilized through a neoliberal approach, mm -hmm. but in a racist way in relation to emergent economies. So the, the video is a video of uh, an European woman coming into this black room, uh, dark room, uh, and then suddenly this martial arts people from Brazil, from India, and from um, China come to attack her. Mm -hmm. And she, <laughs> she then finds a way of overcoming them by multiplying herself around them. And that becomes a symbol of the European Union. And at the end, you have the more we are, the stronger we'll be. It's something like that. So that's, <laughs> that's the neoliberal. It's still on YouTube. It's so it's like you raise this. Yeah. It's, that's one side of it. But the other side of it, which is related to things that have happened in Finland in the last few mm. weeks. Mm. In Uvascula, uh, a far-right group stormed the launch of a book that had multiculturalism on the title. Mm -hmm. There was no violence involved because the police arrived very quickly. And in Yoensu, in the same week, people studying uh, racism in education, there was a research group, they started to receive death threats. Mm -hmm. from the, uh, we don't know if it's from the same group, but mm -hmm. it's something that that uh, it, it might be. They're starting to target academics. So in this context where there are neoliberal variants and far-right variants mm -hmm. of responses to multiculturalism, how can we export one single concept mm -hmm. across the board? Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and, I'm, and I wouldn't suggest that. Um, in fact, I am ambivalent. You know, I, I, for it's, it's, it's almost like, um, uh, like somebody who's agnostic going to you know, different, different churches or different, you know, like, and, and I'm, you know, people who know that it's all about cosmopolitanism, like when I speak with Mika Nava and, and she, she has it down, that, you know, I, I, I admire that because I wish I could believe like she believes, right? So for some of those people, it's a transition that needs to be made. Oh, it's a transition that's happening anyway. You know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but your, your paper has sort of suggested that. It's like when you put post-multiculturalism in it. It's like some people have moved on already. It's like this is where we're going. This is what we're developing. You know, um, go read your uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah, and you can even find African cosmopolitanism, which I love, right? Um, so... Mm -hmm. 
No, I'm not suggesting that we come up with this multiculturalism that then includes all these things. I'm saying uh, some of the alternatives, especially when they become concretized, like what I'm seeing from some versions of interculturalism, um, maybe I don't know enough about it yet, I'm, ju I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that this is an improvement on what multiculturalism is attempting to do as a way of addressing diversity. We cannot not address diversity. So there's no way of opting out. So what are we opting into is the, is the real question, right? Um, uh, anyway, whether it's, uh, you can opt out maybe in terms of theory, in terms of, I mean, I, I love, love the, the woman to death who I've never for, forgotten this, who at, at a conference said, you know, um, I no longer regard identity as my love object. Uh, to hearty applause from everybody in the audience. And I said, well, some of us cannot afford that. You know, <laughs> this big black body <laughs> cannot afford to opt out of identity. You know, um, yeah, uh, in Freetown, maybe I can opt out. Uh, even there, I'm recognized. You're from America. They don't make you like us, uh, like, they don't make you like that here anymore. Right? So, so um, yeah, so what are we opting into? I think we're getting these alternatives, and I'm saying we ought to look at them. I'm saying I'm not yet convinced. Right? I don't know, in the same way that it was go always going to be unlikely that we were going to have official anti racism as kind of, I mean, I was a dyed in the wool anti racist, right? When I was a graduate student. But at some point, you have to think, yeah, but is this going to be policy? We're never going. The policy would suggest we are a racist society and we're working on it. <laughs> That's what it means to have official anti racism. Nobody's going to do it, right? As your national policy. So, what I'm asking is before we throw out multiculturalism, I, th I think maybe we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. What are we throwing out? Those of us who are doing progressive politics, right? Because if you look beside you at who else wants to get rid of multicultural, sometimes it's scary who your company is, who you're in bed with, right? <laughs> uh, if, if, the, if the racist person, if the, you know, the complete Islamophobic person, if the sexist person is right there beside you saying, yes, let's get rid of multiculturalism, you want to say, hmm, maybe, maybe uh, I want to think about this a little bit more before I throw it out completely. That's where I'm, that's where I'm coming from. So my question is, is one of these other discourses going to work? And you're right about that statement that you made about fragile states. This, for me, is a strong argument for Quebecois interculturalism. Right? I don't think, you know, Quebec in some ways, if Quebec bought into multiculturalism, it's almost like shooting yourself in the foot. It's like saying, OK, Quebec is now agreeing to be just another culture. See, Anglo culture can do that. Because Anglo culture knows, yes, I'm just a little, but we all know how whiteness works, right? We all know how Anglo culture, how it's dominant. We all know the English language and the power it has. So you can afford this largesse of saying, this is just one among many cultures, which I, I think the French are being astute in saying, we can't afford that. We can't afford for the French language and for uh, uh, Quebecois culture to be just one among many, we just can't afford it. Right? In the same way that I don't think Aboriginal people can afford it, right? that's even more ironic. If Aboriginal people want to buy into multiculturalism, uh, I, you know, as I sometimes tell my class in a very reduc reductionist way, it's like, okay, I was sitting at home, somebody else comes in through the door, and says, okay, and now I live here. And by the way, everybody's welcome. You know, we welcome them, including you, right? <laughs> I'm sitting there saying, excuse me, on, on my land? So, so for Aboriginal people, so Aboriginal people, instead of being citizens plus, have become the not quite not citizen, just like, I mean, I, I can see maybe how I'm struggling to be a citizen. But I think it's particularly ironic 
in the sense of ab uh, Aboriginal people. So I can understand that resistance also. So I'm not buying multiculturalism wholeheartedly, but I'm saying some of the remedies, some of the improvements seem to me to be much worse. We have time for one or two more questions. I had all those uh, uh, wonderful um, uh, merging of all the debate around multiculturalism and as well education, which we don't normally get. Uh, um, a couple years ago, John Ross and Saul began to talk about this idea that multiculturalism was, in fact, the European interpretation of an indigenous idea. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Have you seen that echoed elsewhere, or can you comment to that? Um, no. And I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about his argument. Um, in fact, I, I'm enthusiastic, enthusiastic about his idea that saying we are a Métis nation. Wow. If, if we really want to take that up, right, because his idea is, you know, a lot of things that we're talking about when we talk about multicultural, or even how we organize Canada, a lot of lessons were learned from Aboriginal people which are not being taken up as Aboriginal people's ideas about how to coexist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, there's ways in which we must not escape the fact that Canada was initially this mixture or this juxtaposition of Aboriginality and non-Aboriginality. So we kind of, his arguments, which I had never thought of, we kind of make this leap <laughs> right? Where we say, okay, there were Aboriginal people, then we arrived, and now, you know, we did everything, and now we're welcoming others, and now we have this hodgepodge. So, the, so there's a sleight of hand which erases Aboriginality, which he is insisting on saying, if we take Aboriginality seriously, and those earlier relationships, which have in fact continued, uh, some of which in literal marriage terms produced Métis people. If we begin to think of this nation as a Métis nation, what would, our, what would the nation be like? What would our policies be? I mean, that is a mind-blowing uh, argument. I, I had a little thing about that, and I decided not to include it. When I included those, those metaphors, I wrote it in and I said, this needs a lot of unpacking, so I can't bring it up. But, but thanks for mentioning it because, wow, there's another direction, you know, uh, Vanessa, your point about, you know, are we, which one, there's another option that we really have not seriously explored. Because when we take up Aboriginality, which we, we either think we, we cannot do, right, or we do in this kind of uh, very reverential way, Aboriginal people, if you're non-Aboriginal, right, and then you go off and you do your own thing. But if you really want to begin to blend discourses, what does that, what does that look like? What would that look like in terms of politics? What would that look like in terms of policy? How would we think about Canada differently if people took uh, John Ralston Saul's um, argument seriously? And, and, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen it. I'm not sure I've seen it, but it, I think it, it really is another possibility of rethinking, rethinking the nation. And I think we just have not done that work. And I don't think it's easy to do that work. Because it's a matter also of what, what the Aboriginal scholars and thinkers and leaders think about somebody doing that kind of work. I, I just uh, have a question about, in terms of the death of multiculturalism. Um, I'm just wondering um, how certain power hierarchy of certain cultures can be like, contextualized. For example, I live in, I live in Richmond, so I have an example of Richmond, because there are like almost half of the population in Richmond is ethnically Chinese. And, when you have such a huge population of Chinese and 
officially turned as a visible minority, but it's kind of paradoxical status because on the one hand, is Chinese is not a minority in Richmond, and, and in many ways. And on the other hand, it is it is still visible. And maybe I'm so cynical about that, but mm -hmm. it could cause another like new forms of racialization because because of this obviousness uh, of visibility. Mm -hmm. But the other hand, of not being a minority is kind of kind of uh, kind of liberation from the historical racial stigmatization. So, so that second part again, I understood the first part. The, the not being a minority in Richmond, and it's a kind of it's kind of emancipation from the racial oh, stigma oh, okay, okay. in the historical context mm -hmm. in the DC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this kind of tensions between this kind of ascending dominant group in Richmond and also the mm -hmm. while still being very visible, which I think could be lead to new forms of racialization. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how do you think of the death of multiculturalism as related to the rebirth of new forms of racism? Mm -hmm. I mean, Richmond, specifically. <laughs> yeah, um, that's another interesting uh, question. Yes, you do have, and we don't have a lot of that in, in Vancouver. Um, the, even Toronto and other places are now changing. But, you know, you have these kind of ethnic enclaves, you know, in, in Toronto, which you don't see operating a lot in Vancouver. You know, like... like when I first came here, he said, like, where's the black neighborhood? <laughs> and there is no black neighborhood to go to, right? Uh, there's no Jane and Finch. There's no, you know, so, so yeah. But, but yes, yeah, certain uh, ethnic groups do become what some people have called a majority minority. That's the term that has been used for what you're describing. So in Richmond, you have a minority who are Chinese, who are actually a majority in that area, right? So yes, with majority minority status comes, yes, a host of other problems. It means Chinese-ness becomes now, if you're looking at it, a lot more visible. People who come to visit me, and I mean, I don't notice it anymore. I actually live in Richmond too. But people who come to visit me say, oh my God, there's so many Chinese people here. This is where you live? It's like, and for me, it's just, this is just Vancouver, right? But yeah, it is, for some people, it's very noticeable. It is so, so what does that, you know, what does that visibility then mean, right? So part of what you're articulating is some people might feel a lot safer, a lot more comfortable, because all around them, you know, you see the signs, your language, the restaurants, and some of us participate a bit too much in the restaurants, this place, in Chinese. But yeah, so you feel comfortable. So there's that, that sense of comfort, being with others that are like yourself, right? But, but you're right, there's also that danger of it's not, it's not even just the bodies, but even the area becomes racialized. You know? I first encountered that when I first you know, uh, uh, came, came to Vancouver and after I'd you know, got, gotten the job offer, I was flown over to kind of look for um, a place to stay. And you know, one, of the, one of the comments that was made, I won't say by whom, is what kind of areas to avoid. Right? So people said things like, you don't want to stay somewhere where you have to go over a bridge to get to, because that's too far, right? A bridge takes a long time. And you don't want to stay in certain areas. So Surrey was not only too far, but too South Asian, right? And, and Richmond was too Chinese. And I'm thinking, what am I supposed to be here in this, in this narrative of areas that are too something or too something other, right? 
So it became like there's the, the racism, interestingly, seemed to be a little bit different from how it would operate in Toronto, right? There's a lot of black people, so, you know, you can't, you can't make a big, you know, you have to discriminate against us one by one. <laughs> so, so, so for Chinese people, you can do your big, just like a rich man. Now, none of them know how to drive, and they all, so you just heap the, yeah, so you're right. So that, that the racialization um, of not only individual bodies, but of entire scapes, right? and entire spaces, like this, this is become racialized, sometimes in very you know, disturbing, uncomfortable ways. I thought that was a fascinating question, and mm. I hope you don't mind, but I'm just thinking of, a, of, a, of a, a, an interaction I had with, with somebody at, at the bank recently where she's quite new to Vancouver also, and, uh, and I asked her where she lived, and she said, I live in Richmond. She, now, she's Malay, she's from Malaysia, rather, and uh, she, she came via Australia, so she said, I live in Richmond, and uh, I said, well, why did you choose Richmond? Because um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the city and, and the lower mainland. <coughs> Slow learner. <laughs> and uh, she said, "Well, she said, you know, um, uh, I want my kids to go to school where there are Chinese people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so being, being, you know, uh, the, you know, stereotype of the, of the, of the, you know, great students and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. and nobody Chinese is a special ed course and you know so forth. And um, so." So I, I think it's fascinating. So, the, so it works both ways, you know. Like I think um, uh, definitely a racialized, uh, what I guess the sociologists call ethnoverbs. These, mm -hmm. these places where people, uh, the similar groups, uh, congregate. But also um, just thinking about how uh, that dominant stereotype has filtered through mm -hmm. the whole society, where mm -hmm. somebody says, "Well, I want my kids to be where Chinese kids are." Like not all Chinese kids are white, yeah. not all white people are white. You don't know black people are white. You know, but but uh, that that was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And of course, every parent wants their child to succeed. Mm -hmm. So all of the, so they imbibe all of these kinds of stereotypes. So I, I found, found it very fascinating. Uh, and then I also like that you, you were talking about sort of the hierarchy. You mm -hmm. know, I, I found that was interesting. I'm just thinking about the hierarchy of, of how. What one has to really say how whiteness plays out in mm -hmm. the society and how that affects all of us of all backgrounds, all races, all ethnicities, and so forth. So it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. it's a very complex issue. There's there's so much to unearth from from what you know from what you asked, you know, and and how and how we're positioned. I think blackness is very awkward in. in Nadu, we were we were in a school, Nadu, like last week was seventy five percent black. Nobody th they think we're lying. Mm -hmm. You know, but I mean it's not it's not point gray, right? But it, it's in Burnaby. Uh, but it, you know, like I told people and they're like, That's not that's not true. Mm -hmm. It is true. That what? At the school was seventy five percent black. Oh yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so so it's in like, Westminster there's lots well, of Well exactly yeah. churches and you know. <laughs>